agreeing with your customers that there, there is a target, like Bank of America is one of my customers, and we have a target. We want a thousand developers certified on Mulesoft. That's a, a, a kind of a deal that we've made when we we, we had the deal. So uh, my my customer is now motivated to help me sell more within the bank. Um, and of course, the number and the size of implementation. Some 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 companies actually recognize customer success for how much professional services revenue partners do that were enabled by customer success, just to motivate customer success to um, to enable partners. Now, I won't tell you which system to buy when you're managing churn and all that. It's a spango people here. I did my job. Um, so I won't say a thing about controlling churn because you know what to do. And that's what you do most of your day, right? Um, and honestly, the harder I tried, there's diminishing returns on fighting churn, right? So yes, if you're starting and your churn is like 40%, 50% a year, fight it to, to get it to like 15% a year, 10% a year. But you're almost done. Companies go out of business. Use cases are not good. You can't fight it. And it's frustrating. So once you get to the point where you say, I'm good, I'm not great, I lost a customer this quarter that I shouldn't have, but that's not the upside. The upside is, is expansion. So I'm skipping controlling churn. Let's talk about what you own, which is add-on. So you should ask yourself, do I really own add-on? Or is it sales? Or both of us? And have that discussion between yourself, your team, the sales team, your CEO, whoever, to ask yourself who owns add-on, okay? And I think the best answer is, is we both do, sales and customer success. Um, and the way I talk to my team is we're a growth team. We're not like revenue preservation kind of uh, unit. Um, Always think about where's the ratio between new ARR and, and uh, add-on ARR. Are you at like the 50-50, which means you're a very mature company, or is it 80-20? And measure it, and measure it, you know, and tell your CEO, I want to be in a point where I catch up for sa to sales, to their new quota, right, new ARR quota. It doesn't matter that they sell add-on, but you want to make sure that, that it does. And I'll give, a, I'll give a, an example of how to build an incentive program uh, to make it happen. So one interesting thing is that if you think about it clearly, you have an incentive to drive land deals to be lower, right? Let's, let's take an example. Okay, you can sell a deal for 100,000 for three years or maybe 50,000 with, with an opportunity to grow to 200. Which one would you take? Really depends. So you have, should, again, should have that discussion with your CEO. I think it's better because if you think, nobody will convince me that it's great to kind of shove everything you have to a, cust a new customer and say, take everything I own, you know, pay me 300,000 uh, bucks and let's meet in five years, right? Th there's no correlation between the value they are deriving out of your product and what they're paying. They're just paying this and now they're catching up to the value. So I would say let's, let's sell less, which will allow to increase the conversion rates of sales because the average sales uh, will be lower, right? And then let us together get it much higher. But that requires another thing that I mentioned yesterday, which is to go to your product people and your finance people and build a pricing mechanism that allows you to increase an ARR of a customer's fivefold. And I'm sure that most of the products you guys are representing, you cannot grow them five times more. Because, oh, they bought 50 users and they only have like 70 people in the company. That's not a good, good pricing. Sophisticated companies create multi-dimensional pricing to allow for incremental growth over and over and over again. And just, you know, if you have this package for the medium, uh, small medium businesses, then you take everything and you increase the price for the enterprise because it's the support, uh, you know, the whole support and the whole service around the product is, is with higher SLAs, so stuff like that. So make sure that you are equipped to, to generate more, more add-on. Um, <clears throat> CSMs driving and enabling add-on, that's a big cultural shift. A lot of your CSMs will say, I didn't sign up to sell. 
right? Why are you asking me to sell? And I'm saying I'm not asking you to sell. I'm asking you to enable growth, which means that you're there for a reason, which is to make them successful, which is a prerequisite to identify growth potential. And then when you identify the growth potential, you got a partner, somebody that can come in and do the hunting, right? You don't have to do it. Some of them, by the way, enjoy it, which is great. They say, you know what, I got it. I'll call you when it's time to sign the deal. You know, they come in different uh, flavors, so let them be who they want to be. So if they're okay, like, dude, there's something there in the other department. I just heard about it, but leave, okay, fine. You know, just walk away, let the salesperson do whatever they do, and you'll still get credit. Um, but it's their responsibility to think about it. And by the way, one time, the first time they'll see their colleague get a $50,000 bonus in the end of the quarter because they sign a big expansion deal, they'll get, they'll get uh, interested. Okay, um, uh, adding on, okay, yeah, and changing your success plan to growth plans. You just change the name. And suddenly it's a two in a box thing. It's not like the account executive is nowhere to be found because they have no incentive to be there. No. It's a, it's a growth plan, right? So where's the account executive with their plan on how to grow this account together with my, with my customer success manager? So a, a quick thing you can do tomorrow to, to change the culture. Think about from day one, thinking about the 12, 24, 36 month add-on plan for that, uh, for that customer and trying to get the add-on sooner. So again, it'll, it'll make you think about the way your contracts are con uh, constructed and so on and so forth. Be serious about your add-on pipeline management. Look at your sales uh, counterparts and colleagues and see them managing a pipeline and learn and do the same for add-on. Understand what is, what, what is your add-on pipeline coverage. Do you have 3x the add-on quota that you want to achieve this quarter, right? If you don't have 3x, you'll never close the amount of add-on. So again, if, if you're thinking about getting to 130, 140%, you look at the best companies out there, 140%, the sales team can go to the beach, the company will grow 40%, right? That's where you wanna be. Um, so be, get serious about and learn from sales. Learn some sales management skills and, and manage pipeline. And of course, using data to predict expansion and change segmentation, it's exactly like, like sales enablement, sorry, sales ops, have customer success ops tell you which are the customers that are more likely to, uh, to expand. And clear roles and responsibilities with sales and have win-win incentives. And I wanna give you an example, by the way, just, just to give you an idea, that was our add-on for CSM quota, and that was what we expected in 2017. That's what happened when we incentivized them uh, in a much smarter way to, to get add-on. Uh, it is fuzzy because the numbers are, <laughs> are I, I did that. Um, on purpose. So um, I just wanted to give you a hint. What will happen if you do this? You'll find out that about half of your expansion comes from the top ten deals that you'll close a year. This this amazing. It happened year over year over year, and hopefully your company is going up market because if you are in the small medium businesses, that's a whole different. We can have another discussion about how to use data to do it. But if you're in enterprise software, if you're going up market and you're selling bigger deals, it just works this way. You need the three, four big deals that will take you from 95 net renewal rate to 115 net renewal rate. And that's what you want to focus on. You need to be there selling it yourself and making sure that it's a $2.5 million deal and not a $1.5 million deal. So that's just to show you where the expansion actually comes from. Um, and I, I showed that slide yesterday, but I'll show it again because it really revolutionized the way our team is structured. So instead of talking about the size of the customer, segment them by the AR potential, we can talk about how you can do that. It's just the, if it's the size of the company versus what they've bought already, right? It could be a big company that bought this, it could be a small company that bought this, right? I want the first one to be more important than the second one because this is potential. Right? So once you do that, then there's another thing, which is a data uh, analytics kind of problem, which is how to um, forecast uh, the add-on likelihood. Are they ready or not ready to expand? Some, you can start with a qualitative ask of your CSMs. Are they ready to expand? There's potential, there's no potential, right? And just segment three 
uh, segmentation. Once you have that, you get a three by three matrix. Then you slice it like that to just make it fair. So every every CSM has some tough ones and some easy ones, and they all have like about the same expansion potential. Uh, or, and if they don't, by the way, we, of course, those uh, we have uh, customer success associates, uh, customer success managers. We have customer success senior customer success managers, and we have customer success directors. Those guys make twice more than those guys. So this add-on quota is could be six, seven times higher than this one, and it should be, right? Uh, and of course, the number of, of customers here is, are much, is much, much lower. So if you have more questions about that, I'll be happy to answer. Give you an idea, how do you incentivize sales to close add-on? You don't fight for splitting add-on and new sales. That's a mistake in my mind. You should just nudge them to close more uh, add-on by saying, okay, let's say your quota is a million and it's a 50-50 and uh, the acceleration of an add-on over 50%, I'm gonna kick it by 40%, but you have to have like a minimum quota attainment of 70% because that's just fair for the, for the company. So let's say they closed $1.2 million with $700,000 from add-on, just taking the 200 extra, they, they closed over the 500, I kick it by, uh, uplifted by 40% and then they get some, some extra. What that tells them is that a dollar of an add-on is is more is worth more, okay, worth more than than a new dollar. Now, if you think about it from a financial perspective, think what it means. It means that the valuation of the company is is in, impacted more by an add-on dollar than a new dollar, and that's true. Go ask your CFO. They would rather have one million dollar more of add-on than a new sale, new new ARR. Unless, again, unless you're very, very small. So, um, so think, because it shows that your, your product is sticky and it has a, like an organic expansion potential, and that tells investors like, whoa, they're le less susceptible for like, may you know, maybe their sales team explodes tomorrow or their VP sales goes out. It's just the, the nature of your product. It's the way that it grows over time. Uh, and there's potential to grow from your customer base, which is always great. Um, let's talk for a minute about cost efficiency. Not the most important thing, but I think it's important. So really understanding the cost to serve per segment, because it's very, very different, as you know. And when you're talking to, about cost, separate your business into small, medium, big. And just talk about three different businesses, because you're running multiple businesses. Those are the benchmarks that I found. A lot of people are asking for those numbers. You, you can use them. The industry benchmark of how much you should spend is 6.75%. The way I got to that, it's 3% it's adoption. It's 1.5, which is half of 3% that is caught, the average cost to renew, to manage renewals, and half of 4.5 for expansion. Again, the, the, the last two are split with sales 50-50, so I just kind of try to make it. And you should show your CEO or your CFO that over time, it, it's, you're becoming more and more efficient uh, as, as percentage of your ARR. Um, ARR per CSM ratio per segment, again, you should show that it's growing. The only way to grow it effectively, because it's capped, you can't, if, if your ARPA, your average revenue per account stays the same, there's a limit. And then what it means that you, you expand with a company horizontally, and that's, it's not a good story for investors. It's like, we're gonna grow 10 times, we're gonna have 10, 10 times more the CSMs. So you have two things working for you. One, you're going up market, which means that the average revenue per account is going up, so you can have bigger portfolios. Second thing, automate, automate the bottom and define that threshold of unmanaged customers all the time to make sure that you're becoming more and more efficient. Um, so, yeah, and of course, as you go up market, the CSMs become more expensive, so that's another thing. Um, let's talk about the, the ROI model. I've built a model that showed the CFO and the CEO. It's like, this is how much we cost over time. This is our impact. Okay, so again, I said that yesterday. If you want to calculate the, that's with questions or without? With, oh. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you want to see how much you really cost, you know that, you should know that, but how much you really impact, you take, you just take about 10% of churn, which is what I think you guys impact. Some of you may, maybe a little bit more. 
And if you don't have data about expansion before you had a customer success organization, some of, some of the customers do have that. Like, yeah, we used to have like 5% expansion without anyone selling. Take what you're selling now minus that 5%, and this is, this is your impact. So that's just a, a, a very simple ROI, and it worked because they accepted it and say, okay, yeah, I see the widening gap. Um, and how else can you impact cost? Uh, automate customer success for lower customer tiers, as I said. Centralized renewal desk. I found that this is immensely beneficial. Take all the paperwork, all the agreement work, all of the communication with the customers, 90 days and then 60 days and then 30 days, all of that, Create a desk with two people instead of 200 people, right? All doing it with their customers and so on. And have them do all of that for the customer success manager and for the account executive. And they show up when it matters, when there's time to talk, it's time to talk to the customer. So all, and if it's just a logistical renewal this time and you're talking to procurement, let them do it all the way. Who cares? So try to remove all the friction around uh, renewal, unless, of course, it's desired friction, where you want to engage with the customers because they're not engaging with you on an ongoing basis. Uh, basis. And by the way, a new concept, self-funding customer success managers. Again, relevant in the top of the market, I had the customer call me and say, how much will it cost me to have a dedicated customer success manager? And I said, half a million dollar a uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> half a million dollar a year. <laughs> and he said, okay. I said, really? If he, he, if would, he would have asked me to add another headcount to manage their account for free, I would say yes. But he called me and he said, I understand it costs you money. How much would you need for that? So think about it because you're investing a lot of energy. And if that's ener that energy is somewhat not, uh, you know, correlative to the amount of value you're getting, try to, try to I'm, I think I'm done. <laughs> right on time. So uh, I know it's a lot. I know it's a kind of a, a very different way of looking at customer success. In my mind, it's a, a more mature way. I have went through like, leave me alone, let me build my methodology and implementation and care only about uh, NPS and what the customer's thinking. But it slowly drags you up and up and up to, to talk the, the executive language. So thanks a lot. It's a 10 minute switch. Yeah. I mean, you look to take. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you wanted to have questions, I'll, I'll be happy to. Can I get the mic? There we go. This session is uh, due to finish right now. However, there is a 10 minute break until the next session. Tal's willing to stay and take some questions if there's anybody who wants to, take a, to give a question. So I'll come over with the mic, but just be aware that people will come in and out. Thank you. Hi. Hi there. Um, so I get the point very, very strongly about getting CSMs involved with sales and kind of breaking down that dichotomy. How did you find, so what I found from my experience is often when you mix sales and CSM, there's sometimes problems of ownership, of sort of where are, where are the limits where each one kind of plays, plays in, egos play in, um, and sometimes that, that, that dichotomy helps sort of separate that. So what did you do to kind of... Uh, it's it's a great it? question. I think we, we went all... Uh, there were like ups and downs and ups and downs. If, if you guys are yeah, sure. moving out, can you just keep your conversations to outside so we can let the questions be answered? Thanks very much. Uh, have you heard about uh, Charlie Munger, the, the silent partner of uh, Warren Buffett, the real genius in the, that couple? He said, uh, never underestimate the power of incentives. And what that means is if you want to understand a, a human behavior, look at the incentive behind it or the value they're trying to achieve. Um, and it's so true, it's amazing. Um, if you put the right structure that says, hey, you guys, two of you, your team, you're dependent on each other. By the way, the big bonus you're going to make this year, uh, Mr. CSM, is not going to go, you know, if, if you, yeah, if you crush it like 100% renewal rate, it's going to be great. But if you do it like a 150% on your, your add-on quota, there's no comparison. We'll pay you way more than that. Um, so... So once the CSM understands that it's not about power grab and who owns the customer, and the AE understands that this person who is spending time with the customer can actually close me a deal, right? They become friends. Everything's great. And all you need to, to do is to have like three, four, five examples where that partnership worked, and everybody aligns magically. No fighting. Everybody's nice to each other. It's true, you have like clashes of, of personalities and so on, but you know, you, you can be there to, to 
to say, hey guys, we're, we're, we're in, in for the same thing here. Um, so, and I'm pretty lenient on who gets to do what. I res I'm very respectful of the fact that uh, account executives are great in building top end relationships. And my team, he wants to have the top relationship, right, but they sometimes don't have the skill to talk to the VP sales or the CEO the same as the account executive have. So sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes my customer success director is so great that the, the, the VP IT, right, or the CIO wants to talk only to, to my, great. You know, again, if the, if the account executive comes to complain, it's like, what are you complaining about, that he's doing your work, right? So, so just put the right incentives in place and let them play nice and, yeah, be there to, to fight all kinds of, uh, yeah. So first of all, thanks for the presentation. I found it uh, super valuable. Um, you mentioned partners and kind of treating partners like customers. Yes. Um, but one of the things we, we struggle with at my company, which has a pretty extensive reseller network, is you know we give partners a, a margin as well. And for that margin, we uh, expect certain obligations. So can you kind of comment on best practices as far as customer success with and managing that through partners? Um, you, you can, well, the, the question is what, 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 if you can clarify, what does the margin have to do with it? We're trying to strike the right balance between, sure, we could give them a bunch of stuff, which we do with customers, but as well, we feel like there's there's uh, obligations that we expect them to take on, right. right? And so kind of the right balance between carrot and stick as far as partners go. So it's a, for me, it's the definition of the carrot because I've seen it happen. You're you know talking to your partners in a specific language, like what do you give me, what do I get, and so on and so forth. Once they sell, start selling you seriously, you just can't imagine the size of the carrot there, right? Once in, in MuleSoft, once Accenture and Deloitte and Capgemini started getting serious about us, it's just, it's amazing what it did to the company as a company. So if you backtrack and you say, do I really need to kind of nickel and dime them on, on the amount of investment I'm making per certified Deloitte uh, partner? Come on, I'll pay for all of it. Not only I'll pay for it, but I'll pay for the time that they're sitting in my seat getting certified because they're becoming those agents going out there and selling my brand. We have like, a, okay. So for me, and we can talk, take it more, there's almost no limit to how much you can invest because you're investing in a salesperson. You're creating a brand, not only creating a brand, but you're creating a brand for the certification. Suddenly the certification of a MuleSoft integrator becomes a thing. And hundreds of, of developers want to be certified MuleSoft integrators, and it's amazing. Not only for that, for new sales and add-on and all of that. So, yeah, I have a lot to say about that. Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you, guys. You, Paul. Let's get